Hello, Bowling fans. This is Dustin J. Markwitz coming to you taped, as always, from the gem along the Colorado River, Laughlin, Nevada, bringing you yet another edition of your favorite bowling show, Bowling Evolved. Join me, as always, as one of the premier left-handers in PBA Tour history, and really just one heck of a nice guy, the one and only Eric Forkel. Eric, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, buddy. How are you? Oh, it's, if I was any better, there'd have to be two of me to handle it all. That's all I'm saying. So <laughs> I can't take two of you. One is bad enough. <laughs> well, you know, we've had some great news, though, Eric, and you can't blame me for being happy. Uh, the Laughlin Cup is now up and running. Uh, our Facebook page is available. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, this is really looking to be one heck of a tournament. Yeah, it should be, it should be really cool. I'm just kind of hoping we get a good turnout, obviously. Uh, it's kind of like getting dressed up and uh, hope a lot of people show up. <laughs> Hopefully they don't, they don't stiff us. <laughs> Hopefully they show up. Oh. Hopefully not. Uh, for you, you uh, listening at home, please to go to bowlingofall.com. Check out our page. We will have a link to our Facebook page, which is our event page showing everything with the Laughlin Cup. This is a satellite for the Proprietor Cup, and uh, I think this is really going to be one heck of an event. Uh, but someone that does know a lot about tournaments is going to be our first guest tonight. Uh, she is currently the sideline reporter for the PBA. She's a former Team Masters champion, member of Team USA, and Really just one heck of a great person, one and only Ashley Galante, and I think I said it right again, which I'm proud of myself if I did. <laughs> well, yes, you did say it right again. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, Eric, I, I can get her name right. Why can't I get you know your name right when I'm thinking of greatest bowlers in history? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 we can discuss that, but probably not on the air. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I got a question for Ashley. How did your uh, position come up with the PBA? Um, actually, I just got a call one day from Mike Jabowski, and he just told me that they were looking for someone to be a sideline reporter for the PBA. And he explained to me everything that the job would entitle and asked me if I can handle the long hours, which I felt like I could. Um, I don't know. Like, for I had no idea how he even got my name. Be honest. Like I didn't apply for the job. I had no idea they were even looking for someone, and they just—I guess they thought I'd be good for the job. Okay. Uh, did you know? Uh, I mean, uh, before it was Jackie. You know, Jackie Bowling, or did do you know her, or did, did have you spoken to her? No, I don't know her, and I've actually haven't spoken to her yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say, while we're on that topic, I, I was going to say, you know, uh, since you've been doing it, I know we had talked a little bit at the World Series, and for those of you who have not seen the videos yet from Bowling Evolve, please check it out on BowlingEvolve.com. Ashley is our second most viewed video of all time. Congratulations, Ashley. Just want to say that real quick. But, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, thank you. But, uh, yeah, you're quite welcome. Uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, so far you've, you've had a chance to really kind of experience everything the PBA's had to offer. I mean, ha have you found it to be, you know, overwhelming or I mean are, are have things been uh, kind of calming down and have you been falling into the role a little bit easier you know there are times where things seem pretty easy and then there's other times where it can be very overwhelming you know with um, them starting to post all the videos that are going to be leading into the upcoming events you know I, I have more stuff going on Facebook and you know I I check my own Facebook I keep up with everybody and I really do my best to answer everyone's question. I really don't like to like not respond to somebody. So it can be a little bit tough at times and I just do the best that I can. Uh at the PBA event, you know, it was so overwhelming being there just there was a lot going on and you never realize how good these guys are until you're out there watching them bowl and seeing what they're doing. Which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> Was there anyone in particular that, I mean, you know, kind of took you by surprise out there on tour? I mean, uh, I, I remember you had mentioned Pete Weber kind of kind of being a real nice guy to you and, you know, when he's not focus, over-focused out there. But, I mean, is there anyone else that's really kind of taken you by surprise? Actually, um, Sean Rash did. I didn't realize that he was such a nice guy. He volunteered to do the best studies with all the Brunswick bowlers and, um, you know, the fact that they loved being there, helping out and bowling with the kids. And that was a side of them I'd never seen before, and I actually really liked it. Hmm. Well, that actually takes us into our next topic. We had mentioned the kids, and uh, as we had talked about off the air, and Eric and I have talked about many times, uh, 
one of the biggest focal points uh, for bowling right now is definitely getting the, the younger generation into the sport uh, by providing tournaments and leagues and whatnot, promoting bowling uh, for everyone. As, as someone that came up through the, the junior program and then eventually you know, doing collegiate bowling, the team masters and whatnot, how has that prepared you for today? I mean, what kind of impact did that kind of bowling have on you? When I was growing up, I feel like we had a lot of um, good bowlers. And there's a lot of comp- – <clears throat> sorry, we had good competition. And I think the competition is what kept me in it. I always wanted it to be the best. I Once I'd go home – like, I mean, sorry. <laughs> when I'd go out to a tournament and I went and bowl good, when i get home, I would practice for hours until I got better on something that I didn't do good in that particular tournament. And right now, I mean, some of the bowlers that are younger, they don't care to put the time in. So when they go out to compete, there's almost no challenge. It's from what I've seen so far, and I'm kind of hoping that the bowlers will start getting a little better. They don't always have the opportunity to practice on sports shots. When I was growing up, I didn't even know what a house shot was, it seemed like. But now I know, now that I'm getting older, it's harder to find people to, who actually put out sports shots. Now, do you think that falls falls at fault on the associations, or do you think a fault at fault on the proprietors, or is it just a combination of everything? I think it's probably a combination of everything. I think that you have people who run the tournaments, and they they don't necessarily get paid for what they're doing, so it's always free, and well, not free, but it's, they don't get paid for what they're doing. And when you go to the tournaments, it costs too much money in gas. You're not getting a good scholarship it's almost not worth going because you don't have the money to go. And then you have local areas like we have leagues and the houses where they don't care to put the sports shots out for the kids. Or even the fact that they care more about their house bowlers during the Wednesday night mixers or whatever they have more than they care about their youth bowlers. That's really interesting, too, that, you know, that there is a lot of focus taken off the of kids. Now, Eric, I'll ask, now, Eric, I'll ask you this question. Now, of course, here on the, on the West Coast, you and I both see a lot of, a lot of different things as far as uh, the youth programs and whatnot. Do you feel that the same thing happens out here as it has been with Ashley as well? I think so. I think in certain parts of the country, I think the junior programs might be a little stronger. I don't know where, uh, you know, Nevada ranks in that, in that category, but... Uh, you know, like we've talked about before, the junior program, that's the future of our of bowling. So they need to get strong. They, they, they have to be stronger, and that's what's going to cultivate, hopefully, bowlers for the future, because without the bowlers for the future, uh, I guess we have no future. So, you know, so you, you have to have, you have to have that. Uh, you know, that it, it, the junior program is extremely important, and I think the USBC is treating it that way. I just feel maybe in certain parts of the country, uh, maybe it's just a little bit stronger than others. Hmm. Now, that brings up another good point, too, as far as collegiate bowling goes. Now, actually, obviously, you are a, a very strong collegiate bowler. How important was collegiate bowling to you developing your game, and do you think that collegiate bowling needs to be pushed as hard as, say, you know, your, your everyday tournaments as some of these other proprietors do? Well, I, what I liked a lot about collegiate bowling was the competition you went out there and you had girls who were competing. And you're going on difficult patterns. I mean, uh, obviously some tournaments were easier than others. Um, but you still had to make shots. And it's a little harder because you have five bowlers on a lane. So by the time it gets to be your turn, it takes forever. <laughs> so you have to you have to adapt to that environment. Most of the other tournaments that we bowl, like just as individuals, you have like maybe two to three people on a on the lane, so that makes a difference in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> plus, you also have the fact that it's just a wonderful experience. It's the only time that you'll be able to experience them. I feel like as growing as a bowler, it's really important because you learn how to work as a team. You learn your mental skills. You have you get to see all different kinds of patterns. Plus, the lanes break down very fast, so. There's things that you can learn from college that you'll be able to take with you past it. With the up-
upcoming PBA league, uh, do you think that, I mean, does that make you excited that the PBA is almost embracing a, somewhat of a collegiate uh, aspect with this, this new experience? I think that's awesome. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Plus, you get to see a lot of the young bowlers who haven't made TV yet actually get a chance to bowl in that event. And it'll be very interesting to see what they do. Uh, so, do we have any uh, predictions on who's going to win the league? <laughs> <laughs> they all have really good teams. Um, I was, I overheard Chris Barnes talking about how he structured his team, and I have to say, I think I really like his team the best. I think second would be Sean Rashes, and third is Bill O'Neill's. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna hold you to that uh, come the end of the league. Here, we'll see we'll see how everyone's <laughs> predictions stack up. As a matter of fact, you know that might be something we will do here on uh, on the Facebook, Eric. Maybe we'll take uh, take our listeners and see uh, how they rank and do a fantasy bowling, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, that might be kind of fun. See how they, see how just like they do with the other sports, we'll we'll try to do something like that for the bowling evolved uh, people who you know like to listen to our show. I, that might give them some fun interaction to do. That that could be quite cool. Yeah. I, Definitely agree. Now, before we let you go, Ashley, uh, I do want to bring up one last thing. Now, I understand that recently you just got picked up for a new sponsorship. Yes, I did. I am on staff with KT Tape. Have you ever heard of it? I, I do not. But tell us. Uh, tell our listeners a little bit about the product. Well, KT Tape is a medicated tape. And if you have any problems in your knees, wrists, arms, shoulders, you can put this tape on that area, and it actually has medicine in it to take away the pain. And um, for years, I've always had pain down my forearm, and when I used it, it was amazing, actually. So I'm really happy that they picked me up to be on staff with them. We're trying to get the local pro shops to start storing them so that the bowlers could actually start buying it. That sounds like a great product. See, Eric, you know, I mean, just because you're getting a little bit older, we can just wrap your whole body now. You look like a mummy out there. <laughs> you know what? If it gets me to, if, if, I can, if, if I can still function, why not? It could be the, you know, uh, it, you never know nowadays. But uh, is, uh, where, did, is this a, where did this product come from? Um, you know, I, it's actually in all the other sports except for bowling. It's just entering the bowling market right now. So um, I'm so not sure a- exactly if the um, if the people in the Olympics were using it, but I know that they wrap their their whole arms up with like a certain kind of tape. I'm not sure if it's the same tape or not. I'd actually do research on that. Oh, okay. Do they have a staff besides yourself? Yeah, there's um, some other people on it that because it's so new. There's I don't really know all of them. I know um, Clara Guerrero is on it. Uh, David okay. O'Sullivan. And I know there's a couple of few other people, but I'm not sure because they haven't told me yet who it is. Okay. Well, we'll have to check that out, and we would, you know, we could welcome all our listeners to check it out as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually on the website right now, kttake.com, uh, and this stuff actually is <laughs> pretty darn cool. I'm not going to lie. I might have to pick some of this up myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can probably we can wrap some we can wrap some around your mouth and see if that medically helps that area. Uh, there, there's no help for that, Eric. I'm sorry. I'm afraid there there is no help for that. But, I don't. Uh, I think the tape wouldn't stop you at all. You'd still keep talking, but that's okay. Yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to take us to the end of our first segment here. I want to say thank you very much to Ashley Delante for coming on our show and telling us a little bit about what's going on. Uh, good luck in all your endeavors, and hopefully we can have you back on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Bye. Ashley, thank you for thank you for joining us. Yeah, we'll we'll, ha- we'll probably I'm sure Dustin will have you back on, and and uh, if you're coming back on, I, I guess I'll come on too, and then we'll discuss once again. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, you know, I don't get a just let me know when you, you want me back on. <laughs> no, oh, Dustin, you want to fire me? All right. Does that mean I get a do I get a little paycheck after that? Do we get a little severance <laughs> or something? <laughs> Well, we'll, we'll if I'm, if I'm, KT fund. <laughs> oh, sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Sounds great. <laughs> so good luck with well, the upcoming okay. season, Ashley, and I'm sure we'll talk to you down the road. Thank you. I will talk to you guys well, next time. All right. You're welcome. Thanks, dear. Bye. Well, 
Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to take us into our first break. Stick around. When we come back, we have more from everyone's favorite bowling show, Bowling Evolved, including our second guest of the evening, Mr. Barry Gurney. Stick around. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dustin J. Marquis and Eric Forkel from the Bowling Evolved podcast telling you about our upcoming tournament, the Laughlin Cup. The Laughlin Cup. I would like to think that it will be a great tournament, and I, I'm hoping that we'll get all the top scratch players around to come out and take a shot at it. Absolutely, Eric. We're going to offer $500, not to mention entry into the world-renowned Proprietors Cup in Ohio come July. But why don't we take it over to Billy Isel to tell us a little bit more about the Proprietors Cup. Billy? Proprietors Cup is a mega buck bowling event on July 13th and 14th. Uh, estimated first place prize is $12,500 this year based on 100 entries. The entry fee is $550, one in five cash, and the shot is modified house. They bowl 12 games of qualifying, moving every game, and the top 10 bowlers will make the cashers championship round. Last year, our winner, Shanna Pulowski, beat out 54 men, and her quest of winning $15,950 first place prize. $15,000, Eric, how does that sound to you? Sounds like a lot of money. <laughs> Sounds great. If I was a scratch bowler, which, oh yeah, I used to be. If I was a scratch bowler, <laughs> I would definitely recommend going to do it. Absolutely. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, that's the Laughlin Cup, a satellite for the Proprietors Cup. February 2nd, 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. squad. Check out BowlingEvolved.com for a flyer and more information. Check it out. Welcome back, bowling fans. It's really great to have someone like Ashley on the show, kind of give her perspective. You know, really growing up uh, in, in, like I said, the collegiate program and doing the team masters, I really wish that there was a little bit more emphasis, uh, not necessarily from the association, but from the bowlers in general on the youth program. I mean, as we've talked about on the show many times, it's really a shame that more of these kids aren't exposed to, you know, what tournament bowling was and, and can be. Well, the, the youth program is, like I said, it has to move forward. And the collegiate bowling has been, in my opinion, has been very good for years. Uh, they've had such great collegiate bowlers actually come out on the tour, and quite a few of them have done quite well. Uh, so the, the, the collegiate program is very strong, and obviously she was part of that program. So she's got a pretty good little background, uh, you know, for her, for her bowling. And now she's involved on the other end of it with the PBA and sideline reporting and going to probably do some videos on different players and what have you. So it's just a different uh, thing for her to work on, but she's got some experience uh, from her bowling days, and uh, hopefully it will bring some interesting uh, conversation to the new PBA. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But speaking of experience, that's actually going to take us into our next guest tonight. Uh, I'll tell you what, Eric, we're actually moving right along. You know, Pretty soon we're going to have 10 and 11 people on our show on one night. That would be amazing. <laughs> I would just be happy if we had 10 or 11 people listening. That would even be better. <laughs> uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a very special guest uh, coming on here. He is someone we actually also interviewed while we were up in Las Vegas. He is one of the top 25 in earnings in senior tour history or PBA 50 history, uh, whatever you'd like to call it. One and only Barry Gurney. Barry, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Dustin, and uh, I, I think you're doing uh, uh, everything you can to promote the sport of bowling, and uh, those of us that uh, uh, are involved in it really appreciate what your efforts, and uh, I, I can't thank you enough for what you do. <laughs> I hear Eric sighing in the background. Well, of thank course. you very much, Barry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think, I, you know what? I'm so glad that we could have Mr. Gurney. I don't call him Barry. I call him Mr. Gurney because... Now that he's on our show, you must you must treat all our guests with a little bit of class and dignity. So I would say welcome to our show, Mr. Gurney. Well, thank you, Mr. Forco. It's a pleasure to talk to you again also. But now that we've got that out of the way, why are we interviewing all these guys who are 100 years old? That's all I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, you're never what, are we too... Have... <laughs> you're ne you're friend... never too old to learn. Mr. Oh, Forkel, you're never too uh, old to what, learn. That's what they tell Even me. when you get to but be 107 years old, you'll still be picking up <laughs> bits of information to make you a better player. Well, I know we had Ozio on a while back, and I know he's old. Well, now we've got you, and you're older. So maybe Thank we'll you. have, you know, we'll have Fred Flintstone, and then we'll get Barney Rubble on next, and we're just gonna <laughs> we're just gonna go back to the good old days of Bedrock Bowl, and then go from there. <laughs> Well, it wasn't as complicated back then because all you needed was one ball and a pair of shoes. 
Exactly. You see, now yeah. there's something to be said for that. See, so there exactly. you go. So uh, go ahead, Dustin. It's your turn. <laughs> I, I, can, I can just listen all day. I, I enjoy this. Uh. <laughs> I, wanna know know, uh, I want to know about the lacquer lanes. I want. Let's talk about the lacquer lanes, since uh, since uh-huh. you know Barry was around back then, he could explain it to us. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, uh, that's actually a, a great place to get into. Uh, I know we were actually talking about how the sport has changed and adapted. You know, we are bowling evolved, bowling yesterday, bowling today, and bowling tomorrow. Uh, Barry, tell us a little bit. I mean, when you first started in bowling, I mean, how, what were the lanes like? What was the sport like? Wow, that was a long time ago. Uh, but back in the long day, time ago. long, <laughs> long before either one of you were even thought of. Uh, bowling, center typically, earth, yes. <laughs> <laughs> bowling centers typically had wood lanes, and they were they were uh, laid out on a series of jacks. And every year, as the lanes would uh, become, uh, uh, I wouldn't say scorched, but they would be uh, gouged in some ways, they would jack up these little jacks and raise them up about uh, about a half an inch or so, and they would shave them with the, these uh, planers. They, it was like a round, a round planer or, or a sanding disc. They had different different types of machines that would actually resurface the lanes and make them as smooth as a baby's bottom. And then when they got all the dust and the de- and the debris off of the lanes, and and uh, they would coat them with a lacquer type of veneerish type finish to protect the lanes so that they would last another year. Uh, bowling, bowling centers typically would spend a lot of money for a lane, and after a while, after, after years and years of resurfacing, pretty soon they'd have to replace the lane itself and put in another, uh, another lane because uh, the thickness was, uh, w- was only good for maybe you know, seven or eight uh, or even, if you, even ten resurfacings. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, once the wood uh, gets down to the nitty gritty, it, the whole lane bed has to be replaced, and that was a very expensive uh, ordeal for the proprietor. So sometimes, towards the end of the life of a lane, they they would uh, cheat. They would just uh, uh, sand it, sand them by hand and not jack them up and and plane them off. And they they try to go two or three years before they re- resurface them. And uh, uh, back then, they also had rubber balls, rubber bowling balls before they went to plastic. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they had uh, actually wood tins. They weren't they weren't laminated or coated with plastic or had any hollow uh, spots inside them. They were solid wood. So the game has uh, changed drastically uh, since uh, I was involved in it uh, in the in the mid 40s, 1940s, Mr. Forco, not 1840s. And uh, <laughs> it, it certainly has changed a lot in the last five years. And it's still changing. I mean, it went from uh, rubber bowling balls to plastic bowling balls to urethane bowling balls to reactive resin bowling balls. And then Brunswick had a had a bowling ball that had uh, uh, reactive uh, resin on the uh, uh, on two sides and 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 a, and a urethane strip in the middle. It was about three inches wide. It was uh, it was supposed to revolutionize the game. And, uh, you know, every ball company has their own way of uh, trying to cope with or come up with new ideas to, 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 to give us the magic ball that we've all been looking for over the years. But, uh, yes, the game itself, uh, the scoring, as far as scoring, is the same. But the game, the lanes, the, 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 the coatings, the lane beds, the surfaces, the equipment we use, all, all, they're all together differently than what we used to use uh, yeah, 56 years ago. Well, let, me, let me ask you this question, Barry. Now, uh, for our listeners that aren't familiar with your career, obviously you had a very distinguished career, uh, most definitely out on the senior tour, had a chance to bowl with uh, some of the, the true greats, uh, other than yourself, obviously. And uh, Tell us, how have you managed to stay so competitive over the last 50 years? Uh I think that's what motivates those of us that are still competing. Is we, uh, it's it's built in. I don't think it's something you learn how to do. You, or, or I think it's, you have to be born with it because there's a, there's been a lot of good bowlers come and go, but uh, they find other venues to 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 chase after uh, after their so-called bowling career is over. Uh, I, I can name several several examples of that, but um, I'm sure you know all the bowlers I'm talking about. But the ones that 
that are still with us today that uh, have been doing this for 50 years, like a Dave Sutar. It's just, I think it's in their blood. They, they love the competitive nature. Uh, they, 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 they like uh, being in the bowling center and, and, and competing. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, how I've been able to uh, do it all these years is I'm still trying to, be, to become as good as, as my peers, and it's taken me a little longer than they have to become as good as they are. And by golly, if, if I stick with the sport long enough, I might, I might accomplish some of my goals. And uh, I've seen uh, and learned so much from the the, uh, the be- best bowlers on both tours, the national tour and the senior tour, that uh, I feel very, very fortunate, uh, especially when I come home and share this information with the with, with the, the local bowlers in, in my area. Uh, but uh, I never really actually competed on the national tour uh, per se. They used to have what they call win a spots, and when the tour came to Southern California, I'd go down and, and bowl a, like a 10-gamer, and they'd take the top three uh They'd get it and they'd give them a free entry into the local PBA event that was uh, there at uh, uh, Gable House Bowl or or wherever the bowling center was that they they were competing in at the time. But they would give away these free spots based on you know a hundred dollar entry fee. And if they had uh, 50, 60 guys, well that would cover (laughs) more than cover the cost of the entry fee. And a couple of times I was fortunate enough to win a free spot. And I got to bowl against the, the the greatest bowlers in the world, and and it was exciting for me. But I didn't really want, I didn't really have the game or the the time to spend uh, to chase after a bowling career professionally. It was just more of a hobby, and uh, I didn't go after it until uh, I turned 50, and then I joined the senior tour, and then I was able to go out and compete against. Uh, the stars that uh, I used to watch on television almost every Saturday on the PBA tour when they used to bowl 40 weeks out of the 52. And I got to meet Earl Anthony and Dick Weber and Don Johnson uh, and, and uh, all, the, all, the, all of the, and, and uh, Nelson Burton Jr. And uh, the list goes on and on and on. And, and, and whether you're competing against them or talking to them in the paddock or just seeing them in the coffee shop and sitting down and have a cup of coffee with them and they talk about the game, and some of the stories that uh, uh, they, they share with you, and uh, uh, the bowlers like Glenn Allison that, that that have been around since the beginning of the PBA tour. It's just uh, it's just inspiring to to talk to these guys, and for somebody like myself, it helps motivate me in into becoming a better bowler and to learning more and more and more, so that I can still be competitive even at uh, as Mr. Farkel says, at the good old age of 107 years old. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> yeah. Not I want to be the first 110 year old that ever won a senior title. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and by the well, way, I got a few years to work on it. <laughs> Dustin, I don't, I don't know if you know this, Dustin, but this is something that I know. Do you know what other distinct honor that Barry has that maybe you're not aware of? Hmm. Uh, well, why don't you enlighten me? He is the first bowler ever to use a storm bowling ball on TV. Ah, that is, I, I actually did know that. Uh, I did forget about it, though. Uh, I think, kind of interesting I, think to do. I think you're giving me far too much credit. The reason I was the first one to use a storm ball on TV was that particular tournament, Naples, Florida, uh, there were two of us that actually made the step ladder, and we both were throwing storm balls. I was seated fourth. And the other gentleman was seated second. We were both throwing storm balls, and Bill Chrisman and his wife Barbara flew out to Florida to watch the show. And uh, since two of his two two bowlers uh, were using his equipment, he he thought it would be in his best interest to be there and a root root for us. And the reason I got to be the very first one uh, to use a storm ball on TV is because I was the fourth fourth seed as opposed to the second seed. So that, well, that's all that matters. You're giving that me far too much credit. <laughs> that's still the first one. You got to go by what it says. And do you remember what Jerry, ball that was? Jerry, yeah, I do. Jerry Bernetti was actually the second second seed, and he was uh, uh, also throwing uh, storm bowling balls. We were both throwing that the teal. It was a teal green storm ball, and I, I don't even know if it had a name on it. It it, it was just. It was just one of their very first balls they came out with. I think back in those days, Bill was still making balls in his uh, garage or, 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 or 
or uh, a basement or something. This is before he had his big factory in uh, Bergen City, Utah. Okay. So I just thought that was kind of press. that's true. I was the first one well, to throw it on TV because I was the lower seed. <laughs> so let's be well, you're, supposed, you're, you're supposed to skip that part of the story. That's what it is. Okay, well, I'll edit that way. out. <laughs> but that's that's but that's okay. That was a let's put it this way: the first time the general public witnessed a storm bowling ball going down the lane. Number one, it was thrown by by you, and number two. How fitting that it was thrown by a lefty. That's why you got a lefty. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here we go. I know, Dustin. That was that was a Dustin. That was a story for you, Dustin. There you go. There you go. Uh, you, you know, uh, I'll just say this real quick. I mean, as much as I respect Barry, I mean, you know, it's you know, being left-handed. Obviously, you know, takes away from the credibility there just a little bit. I'm just saying. I mean, you know, that's nothing personal. But uh. I've never heard that before. That's a new one. Yeah, this is all new to me. I've never heard. Oh, Barry, you're going to go great because the lefties usually kill this out. I've never heard that before. Wow. Well, you heard it now. Now you know. Yeah, yeah. This is the first time in my 107 years I've never heard anything like the lefties have there a better shot than well, the right-handers do. This, now, this when you when you compete in your 108th year out on the tour, then you'll you'll have this information to carry you through. <laughs> there you, go. you know what? Though? I don't really have room to talk. I mean, I only average about 107, 108. So you know, it's really not a lot for me to say. So, uh, and that's no tap. And that's no tap too. I understand. Very good. Eight pin no tap. Eight pin no tap. <laughs> Eight pin. So Barry, why don't you tell us about your latest bowling achievement in Las Vegas? You mean the high roller? Well, unless there was something else you bowled that I'm not aware of, that would be it. Well, I I have mixed emotions about uh, the high roller allowing professional bowlers to compete. I, I just, uh, you know, I don't, I, in a way I don't think it's fair, but on the other hand, a bowler that's uh, still bowling. They allow professional uh, basketball players to play in the Olympics. Well, that's true, but that's, it's, that's, that's I, I don't... It just doesn't seem to me that it's fair to have somebody that's got uh, a professional card and he's got some professional titles and he's been on TV and he's more relaxed under pressure than your so-called amateur bowler. Uh, it just uh, it just doesn't seem fair to me. Of course, I'm going to take advantage of it if they make a rule that allows a bowler like myself to compete. But it just you know, part of me says it's not right, but the other part of me says, well, go for it since you're since you're able to. So. Uh, I did bowl the high roller. It's a senior, the senior version of the high high roller last week and uh, at the Orleans, and and I also bowled it earlier this year, uh, the Easter senior high roller at the uh, Suncoast, and I did well on both of them. And I keep waiting for them to change the rule, uh, but apparently Brad Edelman, who runs that organization, says no. Once he once he made the rule that if you're a a, a, a PBA bowler and you're still a, a current card carrier. And you're uh, competitive on the senior tour, it doesn't matter. But if you haven't won a title since 2000, you're eligible to bowl. So my last title on the senior tour was in 1999, so I'm still eligible to bowl. Now, having said that, if I get hot and happen to win a tournament this year on the senior tour, I would imagine my uh, senior high roller days will be over, uh, as, as our Ron Winger, and uh, some of the other uh, good bowlers, Dave Sutar, he can't bowl. He's won. He won in the uh, in the 2000s. So uh, just because you're 70 uh, doesn't uh, doesn't mean you can bowl a high roller. Because if you had a title in in in, in 2000 or beyond, then then you're ineligible. So they 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 still won't let you play uh, if you have a title, no matter how old you are. So that. So, so it's kind of like uh, I'm, I'm one of the few that are allowed, are allowed to bowl because I haven't won since 1999. So, but still, uh, you know, there's some great bowlers on the high roller that are amateurs, and uh, the fellow that eliminated me that went on to run, uh, be, become second is 75 years old, and he's uh, bowled like uh, 107 of these high rollers, and he's uh, won over $300,000. So uh, that would put him on the top uh, <laughs> 12 uh Earners on the senior tour of all time, and if, if if that was uh, uh, if you if you want to, I, I, I personally think if you're over seventy, they should just let you bowl regardless. Well, I think that, yeah, of I course, Ron Winger thinks that, and so do a lot of other well, bowlers that are seventy, seventy-one years old. But well, I just think that I just think that should be like you should be once you reach seventy. I don't care if you won thirty times on the pro tour, you should 
Why, why not? Like I said, bowling is kind of strange that way. They, they let professional basketball players play in the Olympics, and when they do that, I really don't see the other countries pulling out and saying, you know what, we're not going to play because we don't want to play against the professionals. No, they all show up and they try to beat them. Bowling is so unique in that way. In, all, in bowling, no one wants to bowl that they think they're at a disadvantage or that's not fair. They're always worried about the fairness. But that's why the, in, in, it's, they're worried about the fairness in one of the most unfair games around, to be honest with you. But I, I find the irony of that when you think of other true, what I consider a true sport, like a, a basketball, they, they don't care if a professional plays. They look at it as a challenge, and they welcome it, and they look forward to it. In bowling, they would run the other way and say, no, we don't want them to bowl. They're a professional. They won a tournament 20 years ago. They can't bowl. <laughs> that's why bowling's kind of a joke when you think of it in that regard. Sorry, but it's, but it's the truth. You want to be called a sport. Hey, hey, you know what? You want to be called a sport, then treat it like a sport and allow these people to compete and compete against them and test your skills. That's what they do in all the other real sports. So I think well, bowling either needs... And that's just the way it is. true, though, Eric. It's not, that's not 100% true, though, Eric. Look at, look at professional golf. Okay? I mean, okay. a professional golfer can't go play the U.S. amateur. You know, yeah, I but mean, do they, I, I, okay, I'm talking you know, about if do they have golf in the Olympics that I'm not aware of? Well, no, no, but I'm just saying, you know, right. that's that is another example. So, I mean, the argument could be made that it doesn't necessarily mean that bowling. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. I think that there are a lot as far as uh, the restrictions on a lot of tournaments, but at the same time, you know, I can kind of understand. I mean, there is still a line, although it is very blurred now between amateur and professional. I know we had the big conversation with Pharaoh when he was on the show, uh, you know, about the money and whatnot. But, you know, I, th- does that fall back onto, you know, the tournaments who's running them, or does it fall back onto, you know, the associations not dictating and not, uh, you know, following through with, uh, with uh, regulating the sport? Well, but, that, but that they're, the reason why they do this is because they're afraid people won't show up and bowl. They're saying, well, we... In other words, if we've got, like, for instance, Ron Moore, who is 50 years old, or well, he's over 50, if he, he, he would not be allowed to compete in the senior high roller. Okay, but when Ron Moore turns 70, I don't think at that point it should really matter. I think if you get to 70 years old and now you're going to go compete against 50-year-olds, uh, they've already got 20 on you, uh, so the chances of them winning are already better. What does it matter if you have if, if you won pro titles and you're still competing against younger bowlers that are over 50? So why why I, I don't understand it. Because they have I, I mean I understand, more I understand experience than I do. No. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm just saying that's what I feel is a little strange with these rules. I mean, there's a, these amateur tournaments. I mean, a lot of the guys who do well, the guy the guy who won, Pete Thomas, he's won it many times. He is an excellent amateur bowler. Why don't they tell him, hey, you can't bowl no more. You've won too many. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, they've had, they've had what I've called professional amateurs for quite a long time. You know, Chris Barnes, before he joined the Pro Tour, he was one of the best amateur players in the world. He made tons of money in the amateur ranks. Timmy Mack, there are a lot of guys who bowl in the amateur ranks who made a lot of money before they went out on the Pro Tour, and you know that. It's all, it's all true. Sure. So sure. this, this, am, this amateur professional stuff, I don't know, scratch a scratch. To me, scratch a scratch. I don't know. You're, there's no handicap involved. Uh, I, I just find, some of these rules I find a little. I understand why they do them, but it's to me, it's it's really um, it's not a very good rule. I, I think it needs there, there needs to, it needs to be adjusted. It needs to be adjusted. Oh, sure. My opinion. And, and, like I said, I, I don't disagree with that. In fact, you know my thoughts, and I've talked about it on the show, about you know the viability of scratch bowling. Of course, well, we do have a second. I do want to mention, I know another scratch tournament that's going to be coming up that we don't discriminate against the bowlers. Uh, the Laughlin Cup right here uh, coming up in February. I think, uh, in fact, maybe we have to invite Barry to come down and shoot. What do you think, Eric? Well, I think Barry would love to come bowl, I'm sure. And then Barry's going to be there bowling in Laughlin this weekend at the uh, year-ending tournament for the West Coast Seniors. Um, I'm sure you'll. I'm sure you will get a chance to see Barry personally bowl this weekend. Maybe you'll learn something. I hope so. Well, what do you, What do you think, Barry? Would you be interested in coming up and bowling our tournament here in February? 
Sure, why not? That sounds good. Uh, you know, that brings up one other uh, very interesting point here, and uh, as we got our our, uh, our plug-in for our event, uh, which, by the way, check out BullyingEvolved.com for all information on the upcoming Laughlin Cup. But uh, Barry, let me ask you this, too, and we've kind of talked about the tour, and, and, and there's a lot of different topics, obviously, that we could discuss. I mean, I'm sure we could talk for hours on end, but Right. The big question that I have, and, I, and I'm sure a lot of people have as well, when you look at the sport as a whole, as it has evolved over the last 50 years, do you think it's evolved for the better, or do you think it's evolved for the worse? That's a doggone good question, uh, uh, Dustin. Uh, it, the trouble with bowling, and the reason it wasn't successful when they tried it years ago in the Olympics, it's, it's too controllable. Uh the guys that do the lanes, they can set up the lanes to favor a certain style of bowling. And it doesn't matter how hard Eric works on his game or I work on my game, if the lanes aren't conducive to our type of uh, role, we're not going to be able to keep up with the guys that they're setting the lanes up for. And we've all run in, uh, up against it, and we've all experienced a shutout where it doesn't matter how good you are or how much equipment you bring, there's just no way you can keep up with uh, the right-handers. On the other hand, there are times where I actually feel sorry for the right-handers because they're a lot easier on the left side uh, than they are on the right. And so when you have a sport that can, that can be so lopsided, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's just, uh, it, <laughs> I can't, I can't see why anybody would, uh, pursue uh, an Olympic uh, bowling career because it's just, I don't care, professional or, am- professional or amateur, the games they play on the lanes, and it's all by design, and I understand it, and I get it. It's just it's just not fair to somebody that works just as hard on his game as Tiger Woods does, as Tiger Woods does on his game in golf uh, to, to have absolutely no chance at the starting blocks because of the uh, environment you're bowling on, and that's, I think, the biggest problem in today's sport, it's it, it's too controlled. So does that does that make it a sport or a really complicated game? There you go. That's the sixty four dollar question. <laughs> well, that's the question that I get beat up on all the time every week. <laughs> that's why I had, that's why I have to ask you, Walter Ray and a few other guys and Tommy Jones. They all they don't like it when I say stuff like that because you know they they don't like that. But uh, I, I mean that's when you put all these into it. Yes, if Kegel did the lanes across the entire world and Kegel and the USBC set up all these shots for the houses and you got rid of house shots and all the lanes were done flat and then you had to go out and practice and work hard on your game and challenging. Well, first of all, almost everybody would quit except for the 50 or 60 people who'd want to keep bowling. But uh, and everyone would go out of business because they, they wouldn't be fun bowling anymore because they'd have to work hard like a sport. I mean, these are the things that are just not around. It's you got your house shots, you got your bowling balls that basically strike for you, but people want to continue to maintain that this is a sport. And I think there's an aspect of it that's a sport, but I think there's a very, very large aspect of it that's just a game, and that's the recreational side for sure. But we want to keep talking about this as a sport, but look at all the injustices that are involved. There you go. I couldn't have said it any I better. That's I don't know. It just makes it, well, you know, yeah. and that it makes it it makes it for a sterling conversation. There's that word, sterling, sterling conversation and uh, controversy. And I'm sure you know a lot of my fr- and like I said, and I've competed at all the different levels, as has Barry. And yep. uh, there's all different types of it. But you know, I know they want to keep hammering the sports side of it, but to do that. If that sports side is ever going to become what it needs to be, this whole thing has got to basically start from the beginning. They've got to take the candy away, which is the soft conditions. And you know what? They're not going to do that because the bowling centers don't want to go out of business. They don't want to Justin, go out of business. you know yourself that when you, uh, when you shoe up to bowl in a, a sport, sport league or a PV, PBA challenge league or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, those leagues usually fall apart quite rapidly because you get these guys that are averaging 220 on their uh, local local environment with the, with one or two bowling balls that they bring, and uh, that's all they need. And then when they go bowl on a sports shot or a, a PBA league shot where they put down the 
chameleon or the viper or whatever, and all of a sudden they're averaging 190 or 180 or 175, you know, they go home with their tail between their legs, and they don't like that. Their ego gets crushed. And so, therefore, uh, they choose not to bowl in that environment. They go back to the soft house shots where they can be a big fish in a little pond as opposed to try to develop a, a better game or a better release or a better better form or arm swing or whatever it takes to be able to uh, to average 200 on, a, on a, a much tougher condition. And you know as well as I do, not many bowlers are willing to make that sacrifice because it's it's too much too much of a challenge. And so again, uh, it's it's the the atmosphere in the bowling centers are too controlled. And like Eric said, uh, it's it's it, it's you can't be classified as a sport. It's probably more of a game than anything. Well, you know, I, I find it really amazing. Uh, and when we had Ashley just on the show, she had kind of said the same thing about trying to expose the younger generation the more the sports side. And yeah, I mean, as a, as a you know tournament coordinator and, and definitely as my own career, um, you know, you see, uh, you know, I'd be at home. You'd average two thirty two. You go out on the road, and you're you're lucky to average two hundred in some events because you grow so accustomed to a house shot, and you see some of these guys completely fall apart. But uh, of course, you know, it's, of course, yeah, it, yeah. It's it's just it's a it's an amazing concept, and you know, I, I've always been a proponent that this is a sport, no matter you know, and and but I do think, uh, and this is where Eric and I do agree, uh, and Barry, I'm sure will agree on this as well, is that you know, there's a difference between the competition of what bowling can be and the competition of what bowling is at times. Um, you know, I, I know that I don't like going to a tournament and seeing, you know, a five-game qualifier and I'm looking at a cut score of uh, 250, you know, plus 250. It's just, it's ridiculous in my opinion. Right. So, exactly. you know, it, um, I think that's, you know, I, I was raised as, you know, a, a spare shooter. I was raised to, to be accurate and, you know, both your your games as well, both of you are fantastic spare shooters, as are most of the professionals, of course. But, uh, you know, it, it's sad because I think too many of the younger generation, uh, realistically or honestly, all they want to do is, you know, in my case, move left, throw right, and watch the ball hook. Sadly, there's something else that uh, we're both missing. Uh, I notice that constantly at my local bowling center, these kids right out of high school or in the 10th or 11th grade, they come down to the bowling center, and by golly, if that automatic score-keeping machine isn't working, they have no clue how to keep score. How bad is that? I mean, nobody yeah. teaches them how to keep score with a pencil like we used to do. That They, de- they depend on the automatic scoring s- system to let them know how they're scoring. I mean, they don't know that... Uh, uh, a, a strike means ten pins plus whatever you get on the next two balls. They, they they just leave it up to the machine to tell them how they're doing, and and that's again, it's not laziness. It's just they never were interested in learning how to keep score. They just want to get down there and <laughs> throw the ball down the lane and watch the pins fly around. They don't they don't care about the score. They 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 don't want to learn for some reason. They'd rather just come in, have a good time, and then go play video or computer games. That's that's one thing that I was fortunate enough, at least in this area, we had uh, when, when I was a junior. Uh, believe it or not, because I did start in 1990, there was still not automatic scores in all the bowler centers that I went to, at least. So I actually had right. to learn how to keep score. But, uh, right. you know, I know with, with the kids that I coached, I mean, that was always something. You know, if, if they wanted to know how to, you know, what the scores meant, they were going to learn how to keep score, plain and simple. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's simple once you learn how, but so many of these younger players that are coming in at, at, the, at the, where I where I practice uh, uh, every day, it's just sad to see them come in and and uh, need help. I mean, they don't know, <laughs> they don't get it. They just they just don't understand. They don't uh, they don't know so, how to keep score. So Barry, let me ask you this: If you had to give a tip out to uh, up and coming bowlers or what have you. When they go to practice, what what tip would you give them? What would you recommend? There's a lot of tips I can give them. Uh, there's uh, you're talking about a 170 average bowler that wants to go to 190. You're talking about a 140 average bowler that wants to go to 150. I mean, when you say an a, uh, an amateur bowler that uh, uh, I could give a tip to, it, it would depend on what level they're at. Well, I mean, something that you would build, like something something that you would for a foundation that you would tell someone that it's very important, uh, you know, you should you should work on, on, this is what you should work on, and to move forward and, you know, to get better in the, in, in the game of bowling or the sport of bowling, 
what's one of the most important things that I think most people nowadays just don't put a lot of effort into, but I'm curious to see if you have the if you're gonna come up with what I'm thinking. Well there's the certainly a lot of aspects to the game to be <laughs> What was that, Dustin? <laughs> I was just joking. I said how how to hold your alcohol between games? <laughs> wow. Well if you're a junior bowler that could be a problem. <laughs> That could be an issue if you're a junior bowler, and I don't know if we want to talk about that. I don't know There's what a they lot do of during that when they, when, you know. But There's what, what, so what would be one of, the most, one of the most important things? You know as well as I do, you ha- you, the ball has to fit in your hand. I mean, most bowlers that come in and grab a house ball, the ball's not going to fit in their hand, so they're going to, they're going to, they're not going to, they're not going to be able to roll it accurately or properly because it doesn't fit them. Uh, but you can't suggest that they run into the pro shop and buy a brand new bowling ball just to, that fits them, just so they can have a, a good time. So uh, you, you have to go away from that scenario, even though that is a very important aspect. You have to find a ball that that weighs uh, a certain amount to, that 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 you're capable of throwing. And I think I think one of the most important things is to arrive at the foul line and be in balance as opposed to be falling out of the shot or tripping over your feet or I, I think you I think you gain a little bit more leverage even if the ball doesn't fit your hand. If you arrive at the foul line solid and and and, and don't fall out of the shot, I think that's a very important aspect. But you, you know as well as I do that we could go on and on and on about wh- what's important and what and what's more important than another uh as far as uh, the, the 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 game itself but uh it's, uh, arriving at the foul line on balance to me is uh, okay. Is well, that would be, then that then then that would be. I, I'm just you know that would be your tip would say you need to you need to focus on good balance and good posture at the foul line. I would say instead of running up there and and just uh, sliding all over the place where where you end up uh, turning your body a quarter of a turn so your feet are facing the wall instead of the pins. I, I don't think that's a that's a good good way to bowl and you, you might want to recommend that to you and an adult that's been bowling for you know 10 years that, that just going up there too, a little too quick or doing something in his arm swing to cause him to lose his balance and and uh, rather than just tell him he's losing his balance you, you should point out to him why in your opinion he is losing his balance and there's various reasons behind that i mean it's like it's like these these boys that go down and bowl once a week and they say hey you're dropping your shoulder and say yeah uh-huh. Yeah, well, don't drop your shoulder. You'll throw the ball better. Well, some bowlers need to drop their shoulder. Are you going to go tell Robert Smith not to drop his shoulder? I mean, he has to drop his shoulder to get the, as much leverage and, and twirl on the ball as he does. But another bowler might uh, might not bowl so well uh, dropping his shoulder. So you can't just tell him not to. You have to tell him why or what's causing him to drop his shoulder, if, if, if in fact, that's that's the reason. So. Uh, when, when you when you see somebody losing their balance constantly, you can't just go down there and say, "Well, you should stop losing your balance," because <laughs> they don't know why they're losing their balance. You have to explain to them what's causing them to arrive at the foul line where they're falling out of the shot. I think I think it's important not just to tell them what they're doing wrong, but to explain to them why uh, they're doing whatever it is that, uh, uh, incorrectly. Okay, that's a good tip. That's what that's okay. what I, oh, that, that's good. That's a good tip. That's well, ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking to really one of the true legends of the senior tour and bowling in general, Mr. Barry Gurney. Barry, thank you so much for being on the show tonight, and best of luck in Laughlin this coming weekend. Well, I appreciate that, Dustin, and thank, thanks again for doing what you do for the sport. And, uh, and when you see Mr. Forco, tell him hi for me. <laughs> well, I'm glad, I'm glad Dustin does this for the sport, and, of course, I do this for the game of bowling. So uh, I, I appreciate the thanks. I appreciate the thanks as well. <laughs> well, wait, oh, uh, oh, right into that. Uh, that's right. That was, yeah. <laughs> stick around uh, when we come back. We'll have our conclusion on our show tonight, and a little bit more information on the upcoming Laughlin Cup. Stick around, bowling fans and. Oh, man, I, I'll tell you, Eric, I'm getting exhausted. We've had so many great guests tonight. Uh, you know, we're, we we might as well have one more, right? <laughs> I think we can retire after the show, right? We're done? <laughs> no, not exactly, because we got to no. do one more thing here. We, we have uh, one more great guest and a, a gentleman that uh, is enabling us to run our very first tournament. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the one and only Billy Eisel, making, I believe, his third appearance on the Bowling of All podcast. Always a pleasure to be back on your show, gentlemen. 
Great to have you on the show, Billy. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, it's uh, really been great uh, what the Proprietors Cup has done. And Billy, uh, obviously, for those of you who don't know, Billy is the owner and founder of our, uh, the Proprietors Cup and has the Mega Bucks promotions and, and whatnot. And, you know, he's gave us an opportunity to run a regional version of the Proprietors Cup uh, known as the Laughlin Cup, which is coming up here on February 2nd. Uh, $50 entry fee, both five games across ten lanes. Top five will have a PBA roll-off that we will be recording for BowlingEvolved.com. And Billy, uh, tell us, I mean, why, what does this mean to you to have a regional version of your tournament popping up and satellites promoting uh, what your creation was? Hey, it's a great feeling. Uh, last year we were hoping just to have satellite tournaments, and uh, now, you know, we – we spread out throughout the industry, and we met you and Eric and uh, Bowling Evolved and really support your guys' show, love what you're doing uh, for bowling. And uh, we're a little bit different than some tournaments uh, because we, we're we not out trying to find sponsors to add money to the prize fund. What we're really out doing is trying to get more bowlers involved uh, and, and up the ante of the prize fund with the actual uh, entries into the tournament. So it's, it's a great feeling to have uh, the city of Laughlin uh, you know, get represented and to see a bowler actually from out west to come uh, to Dayton, Ohio. Um, it's an amazing feeling to, you know, you guys would be willing to do that, be willing to do that for us and uh, believe in the tournament. Well, I know we, we definitely appreciate the support that the Priders Cup has given us. Uh, of course, in case you have not had a chance to check it out on BowlingEvolved.com, we are offering for the Laughlin Cup $500 guaranteed first place along with an entry into the Proprietors Cup, which is a $550 value. Uh, really, a, you know, looking at a $1,000 first place prize of a $50 entry, I mean, even though we may not be the Proprietors Cup, I mean, it's still hard to find a payout like that in any tournament. Yeah, what we've noticed is uh, we've, we've been doing a couple of these already, and we, we're having a lot of success already early in the year uh, for an event that's not till uh, July. Uh, for those that don't know, we run a Friday night team challenge, uh, the Ace Mitchell All-Star Team Challenge, and uh, it's not not until July, and it's all just sold out. Um, we're waiting on deposits. People can still get on the waiting list, but uh, to be sold out this far ahead of time with 64 teams of five, a uh, really amazing feeling. Hmm. Well, I know we'll be there, uh, right, Eric? <laughs> uh, that's, that's the game plan. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, I will say one thing, and while we have Billy here, we do want to announce we are going to be running a very special contest in regards to the Ace Mitchell Team Challenge. Uh, for those of you in the Ohio area or, you know, that are planning to go to the Ohio area, maybe you would like to bowl the uh, Ace Mitchell bowling and represent, uh, representation of Bowling Evolved. What do you think, Eric? Do you listen to some of our listeners to uh, bowl for our podcast? I don't see why not. That would be great. Well, I'll tell you, it's, uh, I think this is really great, Billy, everything that you're doing. Uh, you know, I love hearing that the, the Ace Mitchell is sold out. Um, tell us, now, if someone does win the Laughlin Cup or any other satellite, are they able to, and say they're not able to make it, would they be able to transfer that entry to somebody else? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, all entries that are won are definitely transferable. Uh, the only thing we don't allow in our tournaments uh, that are run, uh, you know, guaranteeing an entry is there's no cash value to the entry. Uh, we want to make sure that a bowler is represented that wins. And um, I know this year we're looking, we have over 50 stops uh, that we're doing that are guaranteed stops that uh, some, you know, tournament directors will make money and pocket the money. And what we did last year was took all the money plus a little sponsor money this year uh, to, to guarantee that we would have 50 entries at least into our tournament. Right now uh, we already are 25 entries, uh, you know, registered for the event. So, the goal this year is 110 entries since we had 55 last year to double up since we did lower the entry fee down to uh, $550. But we're pretty confident we're going to get to at least 100 this year. And uh, with support from everyone just like yourselves uh, that actually are putting tournaments together for us and winning a, winning a winning bowler for a chance to win a mega buck prize, it is just a great feeling uh, to know people out there like to you know, unite and work together in this industry. Well, I'll tell you, Billy, it's uh, really great that uh, you're willing to put up an entry for the Proprietors Cup into these regional promotions, and it really speaks a lot for the Proprietors Cup. Uh, in case you guys have not checked it out yet, once again, you can check out the Laughlin Cup at our Bowling Evolved website. It's BowlingEvolved.com. Or, of course, check out the Proprietors Cup in its entirety at ProprietorsCup.com. 
I know they are updating their website, I believe, on January 1. Yes, uh, that is our goal. We got our uh, website guy working pretty hard right now to get everything updated for the 2013 uh, schedule. Uh, we, we've kind of changed a couple dates here and there. We Then we changed some back, so the everything will be set in stone uh, January 1st. It looks like uh, we're just going to stick with the dates that we have right now. Uh, if you don't know, the U.S. Open's coming uh, to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, it's a short drive from Dayton, Ohio, and uh, we're actually the weekend before the U.S. Open starts. Hmm. Well, there we go. Uh, I know that we're... Uh uh, one thing too at the Laughlin Cup will be the week, uh, the day before the start of the Tat National. So, any of our listeners that are going to be up in Vegas for the Tat National, to drive down and uh, bowl that Saturday, have a chance to make some good money uh, and enter into the Proctors Cup. But once again, uh, Billy, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we look forward to talking with you soon. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for coming on, Billy. Thanks, Mr. Porkle. Always a pleasure. You got. Thank you. Well, once again, Eric, I mean, it's, it's so great that when Billy comes on the show and, and discusses what he's doing for bowling, I mean, it's, it's really neat because, you know, here we are, a, a regional promotion, so to speak, kind of kind of getting our feet wet in the uh, back in the tournament scene as far as writing our own stuff. And, uh, you know, with his support, I, I really see Bowling Evolve kind of making leaps and bounds, maybe even running several more tournaments. Well, that would be the goal, and, yeah, it's, it's great that we've uh, affiliated ourselves with, with this environment because it's the only way to move forward and uh, – Obviously, he does a great job on what he does, and hopefully it will it'll help us to do what we do. And between uh, the two of us, we can do quite well for each other. That would be fantastic. Most definitely agree. And I think Mike Flanagan said it very well last week as well about, you know, and a lot of, a lot of our guests have said it about the, uh, the uh, small business world, so to speak, of the, of the bowling world coming together and being able to support each other. It really goes a long way. But with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, this has been one of our longest shows on record, but we want to thank you very much for listening as we do each and every week. Uh, once again, you can check out all of the action on BowlingEvolved.com or, of course, on our Facebook page, which is Facebook.com backslash If you have any questions, comments, hate mail, uh, you want to send us pictures of your game. As a matter of fact, if you want to send us uh, for tips on your game, please email us at BowlingEvolved.com. I know Eric would be more than happy to watch any of your bowling videos or questions that you may have about your game. I mean, you know, he was a pretty good player back in the day, right, Eric? <laughs> uh, you mean, are you talking about me? Me? I? Me? <laughs> uh, I was known to throw a few strikes every now and then, uh, but, yeah, I, I definitely uh, would be glad to video any kind of video, uh, bowling video, that is. Can, uh, can, uh, we can uh, take a look at maybe we give some help and uh, – straighten out a couple of those games out there. That would be great. Yeah. Well, you haven't helped me on my game yet. That's the only thing i got to say. Uh, like I said, there's only so much help that goes around, and when it comes to you, I, I don't know what we can do. <laughs> we'll, try to, we'll, fig- we'll try to figure out something. Don't worry. We'll, we'll work on it. Uh, well, on that feel-good note of the night there, um, <laughs> for Eric Forkel, I've been Dustin J. Markwood. Thank you very much for listening, and have a great night. Good night.